Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and depending on where you might be uh, elsewhere on the planet, uh, good afternoon, or perhaps even early evening if you're further away uh, into to Asia. Uh, my name is uh, John Duke Anthony, and I'm the founding president and chief executive officer of the National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations. <clears throat> National Council is 37 years old, established in 1983. We're a non-governmental, non-profit uh, educational organization. And we're pleased today to uh, be in the spirit of, of that mission of education. And we're going to uh, focus on some of the larger issues at play in the relationship between the United States and the uh, Arab region. Arab region, 22 uh, countries, Middle East, 28 countries, Islamic world, 57 countries. And today we're going to focus on one of them that's at the center and by default, uh, as uh, well as realities, uh, has become the de facto leader of the Arab region and continuing as it already was the leader of the Islamic world. And these are uncertain times and difficult uh, in terms of anticipation or prediction, uh, given that we've just had a national election in the United States and a quite different administration uh, having uh, assumed authority in, in the land and with a mission to try to repair some of the uh, damage and address more effectively some of the challenges facing the United States in its relations with its Arab friends, its Arab allies and its Arab strategic partners. Uh, perhaps uh, italics and capital letters and neon lights should be put on the word strategic because this is the angle, the perspective, the context and the background and the focus and the scope of today's educational uh, discussion. And to lead us uh, in this uh, conversation with two distinguished specialists in strategic issues um, many people are more aware of tactical issues of how to achieve a particular goal and objective, uh, but fewer still are uh, able to be conversant about the strategic issues that drive a uh, tactical dynamics. We have two extraordinary individuals today who specialize in uh, precisely that, and, and to introduce them, uh, we have uh, H. Uh, Delano Roosevelt, the grandson of uh, a former four-time president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and the uh, literal uh, great-grandson of uh, Theodore uh, Roosevelt, uh, America's president, uh, uh, more than 100 uh, years ago. And the certainty and the uncertainty are mixed here. There are ongoing constants in the relationship between the United States and the Arab region in general, in particular with its Arab friends and uh, allies and strategic partners such as Saudi Arabia. And here we're talking about not just the strategic interests, the focus of today, but we're talking about economic issues, political, foreign policy issues, commercial issues having to do with trade, investment, and technology cooperation. And of course, we're talking about national and international and regional security issues having to do with defense uh, cooperation. All of these come under the rubric of uh, strategic issues, the largest of them all having to do with war and peace and having to do uh, with uh, the prospects for prosperity in the region. Delano Roosevelt, uh, brings to the table the following credentials. He's a former member of the National Council's Board of Directors. He is the president and chief executive officer of the United States Saudi Arabian uh, uh, Business uh, Council. He's the former chairman of all of America's Middle Eastern uh, Chambers of uh, Commerce, in particular, those of the Gulf Cooperation Council of uh, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and the United uh, Arab uh, Emirates. He's a former uh, board member of the uh, Mission Hospital in Bahrain, America's oldest 
philanthropic uh, medical diplomacy institution and dynamic organization anywhere in the Arab uh, Middle East. He's a former member of the board of uh, directors of the American Business Association of the Eastern Province of Saudi Arabia. That's the nerve center of the international energy industry having to do with hydrocarbon fuels of oil and gas that are the strategic commodities that drive the engine of the world's economy. In addition to that, he's been a, um, an elected uh, political leader in Long Beach, uh, California. He's uh, a graduate of a military academy. He's lived in Washington, uh, D.C., in the so-called belly of the beast of American national politics. And he's also lived abroad in Geneva, uh, where his father was ambassador uh, to the United Nations organizations in that strategic capital of, of Europe and, and beyond. Uh, without further ado, Delano Roosevelt will introduce a specialist on strategic matters and dynamics having to do with transformations and uncertainties pertaining to Saudi Arabia. This is a vital topic given the uh, ongoing uh, lowered uh, oil uh, prices and revenues to oil producing countries in the region. And given the talks about getting away from uh, dependence or reliance on hydrocarbon fuels, a few topics could be more important, timely and relevant uh, than this one. Delano Roosevelt, Please begin. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. John Duke Anthony, uh, my friend, my mentor, my brother, above all. Thank you for all uh, uh, in your for everything that you've done for uh, the Mid East and the United States over the last countless years. And uh, I, I cherish your friendship and uh, look forward to many more exciting years together, exploring topics like this. My friends, thank you for joining us today. We have a very interesting uh, program for you. Uh, this is a program about relationships. This is a program about commerce. This is a program about maintaining peace through commerce. And uh, our discussion will start today. Uh, it'll be about the Saudi Arabia's transformation, uncertainty and sustainability. But I would actually suggest that it would be uncertainty to sustainability. Um, uh, this region literally uh, uh, entered um, the, I guess, what some might call the commercial and, and modern world uh, no more than 80, 75 to 80 years ago. And what they have done in that short period of time is nothing less than extraordinary. And with that, I would like to introduce our first uh, uh, participant today, uh, Dr. Turkey Faisal Al Rashid. Now, Dr. Turkey, his family has been involved in agriculture for forever in the kingdom. My grandfather in 1945, when Franklin Roosevelt met with King Abdulaziz bin Saud, on the USS Quincy in the Great Bitter Lake, one of the, uh, of course, they spoke of oil and gas. They spoke about protection. They spoke about uh, commercial air flight. The king had never uh, been on a, an airplane before and asked my grandfather, what was it like to fly? And with that, uh, FDR sent him a then state-of-the-art DC-3 plane from built in, in the old McDonnell Douglas, uh, actually then it was the Douglas plant in Long Beach, California. He broke the plane down into various components and boxed it up. And on the side of the boxes, he put agricultural equipment because at that point, one of the main discussion points between these two great men was agriculture and how to develop a shorter, uh, sturdier, a strain of wheat that would have the same amount of yield, but a, 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 a much sturdy, much more sturdy stock to stand up to the weather conditions uh, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In agriculture, they had to find a way to grow and feed themselves. Uh, and it was uh, I, from that point forward where 
the, the uh, Al Rashid family had had been into agriculture, so I feel a direct kinship to my friend Dr. Turkey Faisal, uh, in that both of our families. Uh, this is such an important uh, aspect of life, and to our families, I've always felt a special kinship to him. So this is truly an honor for me to introduce uh, this terrific friend and individual. Uh, to all of you out there. Um, he has also had a, a tremendous uh, involvement with the University of Arizona uh, and um, as a professor. There is so much more that we would take up the time from the importance of this message here today. So with that, uh, to my dear friend, Dr. Turkey Faisal, the floor, sir, is yours. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening from Malik. Riyadh. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning in Washington, good afternoon in London, and good evening in Riyadh. My name is Turki Faisal Rashid, as my uh, uh, great friend here have uh, introduced me. I speak to you from Riyadh. It's really my great pleasure to participate in this important event to talk about Saudi Arabia transformation, uncertainty, and sustainability book discussion. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Uh, John Duke Anthony, the founding president and chief executive officer of the uh, national uh, US Arab relation. Thank you, H. Delano Roosevelt, president and chief executive officer of the US Saudi Business Council. Thank you, Pat Mancini, and all the group of the NCUSR Organization Committee for making this uh, engaging event possible. We are fortunate to have you as audience for the support whom we hope will get uh, to meet. Saudi Arabia has launched a Vision 2030 to diversify and transform the economy uh, away from oil revenue. I'll present uh, a quick initial review of my book that will take about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, as you could see, the topic of, uh, of, of our discussion today and uh, the theme of the book, the main theme of the book is uh, the sustainability, the triple bottom line sustainability. Next. Next si slide, please. Saudi Arabia uh, management of long-term strategic vision. The government of Saudi Arabia has been pioneering the management of long-term vision since uh, 2002. The Saudi leader experimenting on how to turn its uh, system uh, of development plan into a modern uh, strategic planning. Vision 2030 was launched in 2016. It's building on those pioneering and experimenting long-term vision. Uh, next, the next four slides, it will present uh, a timeline of some key uh, events. So on October 2002, uh, there was a conference on Saudi Economic Vision 2020. It was organized then by the Ministry of uh, Economic and Planning with the theme on economic diversification, development of human resources, expansion of public service, promoting a private sector, modernizing the governance structures of the public sector to meet uh, challenges of implementation. The eighth development plan, which is 2005 to 2009, long-term vision economic and development strategy to achieve sustainable development. The plan 
uh, envisions in, in to implement economic reform, support the private sector, and maintain economic sustainability. The eighth development plan is the first five years plan. Uh, it's prepared in the context of long-term development strategy with a definite target and objective. Uh, a strategy designed to provide a, a, a framework of uh, successive five years plan, which goes until 2024. The first development plan was launched in uh, 20, uh, 1970. Next slide. Uh, in 2010 to 2014, the nine development plan, 2010-2014, the themes improving the standard of living and quality of life for the citizen, development of the national human resources and their employment, restructuring and the national economy, balanced development within the regions of Saudi Arabia to enhance the competitiveness of the national economy and to expand the Saudi product in both domestically and internationally. Additionally, the plan will focus on economic and institutional reform, privatization program, technology and informatic development, uh, raising the efficiency of the public uh, service and the private sector, development of natural resources, such as water and environment protection. The above development into uh, Vision 2030, uh, the main three pillar. Next. <clears throat> On April 2016, Saudi Vision uh, 2030 with the following uh, three pillars, a vibrant society, a thriving economy, an ambition nation. On a private, uh, on a, a vibrant society, strength Islamic and national identity offer a fulfilling and healthy life. On the thriving economy, grow and diversify the economy, increase employment. Ambition nation, enhance government effectiveness, capability, agility, the capacity, enhance social responsibility. In 2016-2020, the National Transformation Program, NTB, launched uh, in June 2016 to build the capacity and capability required to achieve the ambition goal of Vision 2030. Next. On, uh, on 2017, a strategic vision realization program was launched by the Council of Economic and Development Affairs to achieve the vision 2030. 2018 to 2020, the National Transformation Program Delivery Plan, in line with the launch of a new vision 2030, uh, VRPs changed to the first version of NTP had to take uh, place. Those changes require adaption, integration, and rearrangement of many initiatives established under the first visions of the NTP delivery plan into the relevant VRP uh, delivery plans. Next. Civil services capability. The more that a long-term vision for a country involves a highly complex changes and culture change, then the more important that the civil service have the following capability to make success of the implementation process. Capabilities in using an experimental approach to policy and planning reality testing of ideas, that is testing out ideas about how to implement uh, a long-term uh, strategies vision. Monitoring, evaluating, capability 
that support uh, learning during the implementation uh, process. <clears throat> Agility in putting lesson learned from monitoring and evaluation into a practical during the implementation uh, process. Next. We will do uh, a string uh, challenges opportunity facing the Saudi region. <clears throat> what are the, uh, the number one uh, string of Saudi Arabia? It's a well-developed, comprehensive, long-term strategic vision. It has a challenge of the uh, implementation and the planning. It has an opportunity. The public sector is a catalyst of change, private sector engine of economic growth. Saudi Arabia have improved uh, 30 ranks on ease of doing business, according to the World Bank. The public servant, uh, this is the, one of the challenges, knowledge and experience in implementation of the projects. The opportunity increase women uh, participation in the labor market. Uh, another strength of the Saudi Arabia, they have launched investment Saudi platform to promote the kingdom as an investment uh, destination. The challenges is cooperation and coordination within the organization. The opportunity implementing of commercial policy and the regulation reform link that budget and strategic opportunity. Next, please. <clears throat> Saudi leadership characteristic proven and require a, 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 a Saudi Arabian leadership requirement to achieve the national transformation. <clears throat> we have a blend of a young, energetic, guided by experienced key people. Come to my mind, King Salman with the Crown Prince. Approximately two thirds of the Saudi population are under the age of 35. So it's a young society. We have over 800,000 Saudi youth uh, educated in the West. Leadership is fully equipped to deliver the transformation. Leaders focus on their strong point, capabilities and uh, capacity. Next. We will choose some of the major success on the last uh, few years. Ministry of Housing, they have achieved through their program, a second housing program, they have delivered 1.1 million provided to Saudi, that's about 30% increase since 2017. The Ministry of Labor, they have launched women programs, empowerment, and now women consist about 35% of the Saudi uh, workforce, comparing to 23% in 2019. The Ministry of Commerce, they launched a program called business environment reform, they have achieved a reduction of license requirement by 54%. Uh, so that is the achieve, some of the achievement which we are talking about. Next, please. The Ministry of Tourism have launched uh, or made Saudi Arabia as a tourist destination. They have launched uh, a tourist e-visa or visa uh, arrive uh, to uh, 49 uh, country. They have issued approximately 3,000 uh, investment licenses. The Ministry of Communication and Information Technology, they have launched a program called the e-service on the healthcare, uh, justice and Islamic affair, transportation, communication, labor and employment, financial and commerce. It has increased government digitalization to 81% in 2019. The Ministry of uh, Environment, Water and Agriculture, their water desalination program, they have achieved the world's largest capacity in desalination water 
production. Next, please. The Ministry of Environment and Water, their food security program, they have achieved a strategically uh, providing 30% of the total food available for consumption locally. They have achieved self-sufficiency in uh, fresh milk, uh, table eggs, and uh, vegetables. They have exported uh, white uh, shrimp. The Ministry of Health developed uh, a call center 937, and they really did a fantastic job during the uh, pandemic. They provided service uh, with, with, with an outstanding record. In 2019, they received 9 million calls. In September 2020, 2020 alone this month, they have received 2 million calls. Next. To summarize my uh, presentation, this presentation concentrates with the Saudi Arabia transformation into a diversified economy away from frontier economy. Development of a strategic state, what I mean by strategic state, which is catalyzing of societal action and by interactive relationship with other, both or the formulation state of strategic planning and the delivery stage. Our research focus on the following, strategic process capability, effectiveness of Saudi leadership, effectiveness of public servant, stockholders involvement, implementation of national transformation. Our research based on the best available information to us in terms of the triple bottom line, sustainability on economic, social, and environment. Next, please. To conclude my talk, strategic transformation and economic diversification are available through creation of long-term strategic vision, backed by government increase, ability to implement policy for the benefit of the country in achieving the uh, vision's goals and objective. In the face of the constraint and challenges like collapse of oil and the current COVID-19 global pandemic, the kingdom demonstrate that even in the face of hardship, it has shown the de determination to pursue the country's sustainable and strategic transformation into diversification uh, diversified economy. Saudi leadership aimed to create a society for Saudi citizens that is prosperous because it is diversified economy and a society that has uh, a happy citizen who are satisfied with their life. Next, I'm happy to answer your question, but my final note is the theme of this research the theme of this early finding of our book is we did not look at what type of government. We have looked on how credible, able to deliver good service, good uh, communication with the uh, stakeholder to achieve uh, their goals. We're not undermining the theories about the importance of the type of government. But this is out of the scope of the book. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll be happy to answer your question. Back thank, to you. thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Turkey Faisal. Um, I, um, well, I think we're going to do questions uh, at the end uh, after our next commentator. I did want to say um, on a personal note, thank you, your presentation uh, the structure of it was ever so important because you started out with uh, the history of, of where we came from in Saudi Arabia and the, the, uh, uh, the programs that led up to 2030, uh, the 2030 vision program. And that's always ever so important because the history always educates, always, always educates the present. And from the present, 
uh, that's how we build a, a sustainable future. So it was a very well laid out presentation and I thank you for it. Um, now my friends, if you'll join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Paul Joyce, I'm gonna to read to you a little bit of a background on, uh, on Professor, Professor Paul, uh, University of Birmingham, UK Institute of Local Government Studies Associate, Leeds Beckett University Visiting Professor in Public Management, uh, International Institute of Administrative Science, Sciences and Publications Director. We certainly couldn't ask for a more qualified individual to give some commentary on everything that you've just heard. So with that, Professor, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, in this commentary, uh, it's not my intention to introduce anything new at all. It's more to underline some of the points that Turkey was making just now. The first one um, I think is worth making, which is that you can see we've approached this from a public administration perspective. That means we're interested in the institutions and organizations. So we're interested in public governance, how the government relates to the public and vice versa. The civil service, public services, regulation, long-term visions uh, and, and implementation of those long-term visions. In fact, that's probably our key focus, delivery of those long-term visions. Strategic planning, efficiency and effectiveness, partnership working, engaging the public, and you were hearing from Turkey also, we we're interested in agility. Um, one of the things I'd like to underline here is that we are very focused on the long-term vision for the country. Uh, and when we look at that, there's a lot of evidence around now, I think there's a lot of evidence around that government capabilities, we are judging them more and more in terms of can a government deliver its long-term vision? And so perceptions around the world of this is a good government or that's a bad government are strongly tied these days to the ability of that government to take the aspirations in a long-term vision and make a reality of it. Um, in terms of some of our background assumptions, I would point you to the OECD. And in late 2019, they've approved uh, a policy statement on sound public governance. And a lot of the assumptions in there are ones that we're interested in checking out and testing. If I was gonna say there's one big issue that we're looking at in all this, it would probably be the, can Saudi Arabia achieve a whole of government approach? And subsequently, can it achieve eventually a whole of society approach? And to do that, um, the government and the civil service needs to be very well integrated. There are a small number of countries around the world that are thought to be highly integrated. Uh, they would include um, some Northern European countries like Finland, Norway, Denmark. Singapore has got a very, very good reputation too as a government. These, are, these governments are all very integrated now they operate. They operate more or less seamlessly. My hypothesis that I put to you that uh, Turkey and I have been discussing is that in order to deliver a long-term vision, such as the one that Saudi Arabia wishes to deliver, they need to integrate their management and organization around that long-term vision. It's not just an add-on, something you put on, you need to be organized and managed around that vision. To use management systems, the budget, performance management, IT systems, HRM systems, and in order to align the uh, actions of the civil servants to deliver that vision. And as the Saudi government was saying back in 2002 and 2003, as Turkey mentioned, back then they were saying they wanted to take a long-term view, not just five-year development plans, they wanted to look much further ahead and that's when that whole spirit of long-term vision came in in Saudi Arabia. But they also said in moving away from five-year development plans, they were gonna give much more importance to monitoring and evaluation. And even back then they were saying, you know, part of this, not about just simply top-down direction and control, you need monitoring and evaluation of what you're doing in order to learn, revise, refine, 
or, or as Turkey said, test reality and, and then learn from it and improve it. And the last um, hypothesis would be that if you really want to enhance monitoring and evaluation, that there is a need for the civil service to engage the public or sections of the public or the business community because in learning what's working and what's not working and why it's working and why it's not working, they, there is some very valuable information, evidence possessed by the business community or the public or bits of the public. So if you really want to develop a capacity for learning and improving, um, in the end, you've got, you've got to bring the public and the private sector into that process. Um, I think we, we get signs, I'm, I'm saying this now, not like Turkey as someone who's, who's very closely involved in uh, seeing what's happening in Saudi Arabia, but someone who's a bit further of distant away. Um, but I think we can see a number of signs that, that things are changing, that the integration is, a, is coming, that the effectiveness and the capability is developing. First piece of evidence would be at the World Economic Forum in January 2018 and a number of ministers from the Saudi government were present and were talking about uh, what they were trying to do. Um, I, I'll give you two examples. The Minister of Finance at that uh, special panel in the World Economic Forum was saying that they were really working hard on getting better alignment between the ministries and he was talking about they were doing something they'd never done before. They were talking to each other in the evenings at other times and working really hard in, in terms of getting what each ministry was doing coordinated and collaborating with what other ministries were doing. And the Minister, Minister of Commerce and Investment uh, said at the World Economic Forum that they were creating, they were in the process of creating a culture of planning because it's very easy to pull in consultants, management consultants who produce very lovely glossy documents, but you need a culture and that culture has got to be bedded in to the civil service of a country. And they were saying, yes, they were doing that. They were developing that planning culture. Um, so what I would like to stress now from a distance, it looks like something is happening with the capabilities of the civil service in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the World Bank, publishes, has published for a long time, world governance, worldwide governance indicators. And one of those is a perception of effectiveness. And if you take a very long-term view on that, you go back and I've, I've looked back as far as the mid 1990s, um, there is a, there's a, a tracking of how effective the government is based on uh, large amounts of survey work. And I certainly think you can see that from 2005 onwards, a definite improvement in government, government effectiveness that steadily increases right up and into the period in which the latest long-term vision has been developed. So it looks to me this like this is the long, steady hard work of building a civil service that can actually deliver long-term visions. Um, and I think should give us some uh, encouragement to think that may well be happening. The final point I wanted to make is that from a public administration perspective, the feeling is that simple top-down approaches to delivering a long-term vision like this no longer are enough. You need the strategic leadership at the center. You need the coordination oversight from the center of government and Saudi has created some institutions to do that. Um, but you then need a kind of much more interactive process in the delivery chain. And that interaction, for example, is between the center of government and the ministry, and then subsequently between the ministry and the public. So that if there are problems in delivery, that there's a problem solving process in the, and a consultation process, so that learning really does take place. It's, it's very easy to have uh, monitoring evaluation systems that simply tick the box and say, oh yes, we've monitored it. But it's that interaction that's gonna prove crucial to just how much of the long-term vision of Saudi Arabia can actually be delivered. Thank you very much.
Professor, thank you so much for your valuable insight. Um, that was a wonderful way to sum up the presentation made by Dr. Turkey. Um, and so uh, my friends, this was a wonderful interjection of, of uh, to, uh, into your brains, if you will, uh, the history of, of how uh, the strategic, strategic visions came about uh, as was mentioned in 2002, it started with the with the uh, the initial concept of wanting to form something like this. Uh, uh, Professor Joyce mentioned it wasn't until about 2005 that this really started to come together, which I can personally attest to, as uh, a lot of you might not know. But starting in 2005, I embarked on my personal involvement. Uh, uh, and career uh, in Saudi Arabia, working as director of new business development for a major Saudi trading family, uh, which lasted 15 years of my life. 15 years I spent in the in Jeddah, in the eastern province, and also a number of years uh, over in the Kingdom of Bahrain, uh, understanding, getting to understand better and better the the culture of the people, the culture of business, uh, uh, and. Um, uh, could not have had a more blessed experience uh, from the eighth development plan to the ninth development plan to the present vision 2030. With this vision 2030 plan, I can attest to you that indeed Saudi Arabia is open for business. This is, uh, and the reason I can say this so confidently is because they have learned from where they come from and they have sharpened and, and perfected the programs uh, to make a Saudi Arabia a place that can, quote unquote, be open for business. Uh, the, most recent, uh, uh, the most recent addition to their, to their tools in the toolbox has been the formal creation of the Ministry of Investment, uh, MISA, yeah. as they call it, M-I-S-A, which is, has uh, Minister Khaled Al-Faleh, uh, the recent uh, head of Aramco as, as uh, uh, taking the helm of MISA. Uh, they have a, an office here in the United States uh, under the uh, brand of Invest Saudi, run by a, a brilliantly uh, sharp young individual by the name of Abdul Rahman Bakir uh, here in Washington, D.C. And between MISA and our humble organization, the U.S. Saudi Business Council, uh, the question or the answer to you that a lot of you might be having watching this is, what does all this mean to me? How do we take advantage of this? How do we find out more? How do I get my product or services uh, introduced into the kingdom of Saudi Arabia? Well, my friends, you're looking at uh, three organizations here between the National Council of U.S. Uh, Arab Relations, the U.S. Saudi Business Council, and uh, the Ministry of Investment, MISA, uh, uh, this is your avenue in. The roadmap into Saudi Arabia to start business uh, can be intimidating and daunting. Uh, American companies that I talk to every day understands that there are tremendous opportunities for the growth of American businesses, and not just the big guys, but I would dare say that the small to medium enterprises are have a terrific opportunity now for growth uh, over there and here. The incentives that have put, been put into place in the, to attract U.S. business to set up and create manufacturing opportunities, final assembly opportunities to support the larger projects that have gone on over there that are that are going on over there uh, are tremendous. And so this would be uh, your first couple of stops would be any of these organizations that you see here today and inquire further because our model is simple, is that once we've made an introduction for you, the American company, to a Saudi potential, uh, at that point, if, if you're saying, yep, I want to do it, and they're saying, yep, I want to do it, we then lock arms with you through the entire process 
from simple thing of getting a visa to get there and learn more to getting business licenses, a certificate of registrations to conduct business in the kingdom, to finding the right partner, uh, to everything that you would need from soup to nuts in setting up a business operation in Saudi Arabia. So we take that factor that can be somewhat daunting out of the equation. With that, I would like to then uh, to now go to a few questions that we have. And I would like to start, please, this one will be addressed to Dr. Turkey. Uh, the question is, in your, uh, from your sense, uh, sir, how is Vision 2030 and the many changes being received by the people of Saudi Arabia and the business community? Well, just a, a comment here first on your uh, opening. I didn't want to go into that. Then we will touch a hard uh, subject, which is the first meeting between King Abdulaziz and uh, Roosevelt. The main topic was uh, food, which is the basic human being need. And yes. that was developed into with the University of Arizona. And they launched a program in 1948 they launch a program in our card for uh, agriculture. That is a side note. When we get into uh, the vision, a government vision, a strategic vision, it's, not, it's like the rainbow. It has so many colors and it's so many area. That is one area could be excellent. One area could be touched on the other people's uh, uh, interest. Saudi Arabia, the way we were operating, it just is non-sustainable. Currently, about more than 80% of government budget goes into uh, daily expense, which is salary and subsidies. So that has to be uh, changed. Uh, all the private sectors depend heavily on government uh, spending. So we're trying to uh, regenerate this. While we're trying to do this, we have the, the collapse of the oil. At the same time, we have the COVID and we need to move uh, forward. So if we look at, we're, we're here in the mood of pandemic. If you look of how did the Ministry of Health have performed on the uh, vaccine, obtaining the vaccine, distributing the vaccine. You could log in through your phone, whether you're a Saudi or non-Saudi, even for illegal immigrants. They could log in and they could go get their uh, vaccine uh, shots. Uh, personally, I got, uh, I got an appointment and uh, for my first one, but because of the supply problem, they have delayed my second shot. Now I just received an, a message saying uh, you could resume or you could make your meeting next uh, faster. My second appointment is next uh, Saturday. So the vision, it has affected in general, it has affected a lot of people and affected them positively. You could do a lot of the work on the e-government. You could study on, uh, on online. You could make your uh, doctor consultation. You could do a lot of your legal. So in a lot of factors, it has uh, made uh, a lot of benefit. While some other sectors could be harmed, yes. And that is the normal. It depends what color of the rainbow you're looking at. I, I, I would have I to agree uh, uh, with you wholeheartedly on that. The, the um, the ease of doing business has has greatly increased. Uh, I never thought there would be a time when uh, we were able to to uh, get a a not just a tourism visa for a member, but a business visa, a five year business visa in less than twenty four hours. I mean, it, it's absolutely unheard of. So in that sense, yes. Um, uh, the ease of doing business has has greatly increased. Um, there was a question here that I noticed: the what is the role of small and medium-sized companies, and the role of entrepreneurship 
uh, to diversify away from dependence on oil and gas. Well, my friends, I'm here to say that uh, let's, let's uh, answer that question in, in real time, shall we? Uh, there is a project in the Eastern province called, and this is to bolster the, my, my confidence that there's opportunity for small to medium enterprises in the US to, to sell their products and set up, plant their flag in Saudi Arabia and create business opportunities. In the Eastern province, there's a, there's a project and it's called Sadara. And Sadara, you, a lot of you might be familiar with, it's a joint venture between Dow Chemical and Aramco, right? Uh, uh, agreed, a couple of the big boys, you know, the big guys, they're there. Where's the opportunity that I'm referring to? The opportunity is, is that this Sadara petrochemical refining plant is the largest uh, on the planet. And I believe it's up to, or will be soon, uh, it's actually 26 individual refining plants in one footprint that make up Sadara with tens of thousands of employees working the last I heard two shifts and it might be might be going 24 seven at this point might be going three shifts. But think about those numbers as an American business and think about that small city uh, bigger than maybe a lot of US cities uh, uh, by their own right. Uh, imagine the consumables, the daily consumables of that operation. And, and don't you think that there are opportunities for just about uh, anything that you can imagine to help support an operation like that? Sadara is not the only one. Ma'adin, the aluminum plant with, with Reynolds Aluminum. Uh, it, it, the, the list goes on and on. And as the kingdom is wholeheartedly supporting and encouraging their own small to medium enterprises to come about, uh, uh, these young entrepreneurs to, to help support them. They've created a, uh, their own version of the XM, uh, U.S. Export Import Bank, to help uh, shore up and, and assist uh, young new businesses. And those young new businesses are going to be wanting to meet U.S. young new businesses over here. And that is all of our collective jobs here that you're, you're seeing here today to put those entities together. Um, the, uh, let's move to another question here. How is the agriculture sector developing and responding to food security? Dr. Turkey, this is right down your fairway. Well, we really have achieved a, 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 an outstanding uh, jobs when it's come for the Ministry of Agriculture of, and the Ministry of Trade providing uh, food. Uh, if you go to the supermarkets, supermarket was full of all supply. We were lucky. I mean, let's not underestimate the luck on this because <laughs> pandemic took place when there is two occasion happening in Saudi Arabia. The Hajj is coming, Ramadan is coming. So those, during those two months, our stock of food and supply should be to the maximum uh, limit because we will entertain Hajj and Ram, uh, Ramadan. So when the pandemic hit Saudi Arabia, we were luckily all our stock uh, was uh, full. And we have depend on our local agriculture. Our local agriculture, it has a major uh, difficulties and a major uh, obstacle, which is water. Water is the main issue. And that's why we're starting to develop. If you look at the national agriculture strategy, it's uh, drops, crops per drops. So we have to measure exactly every drops of water. What can we get on the food? So the food was available and it is the, the supply chain. We were lucky uh, to have it. Many people ask me, why did Saudi Arabia did a good job? I think we were mentally ready because every year we have the Hajj season and almost every virus you could think of in the world will be coming to Saudi Arabia. So we have to be ready. We have to be ready with the vaccine. We have to be ready for all kinds of viruses every year. Now, 
King Salman have made a decision which is unthinkable. Closing Mecca, closing uh, the mosque, it's unthinkable. Me personally, I did not go to mosque for nearly six months. I did not go for a prayer because we, are, we were banned to go. So those decisions with the supply chain, I think we did uh, a very good job on the food security. I cannot complain myself. I, I would agree. And they were, the, the kingdom has been brilliant in setting up their own operations uh, uh, in dairy and in providing fruit juices and their own poultry. My gosh, uh, Al Marai is one of the largest, if not the largest producers of, of dairy and poultry on the planet. So, um, and I might add also um, that uh, that the that modern farming, you know, or racking racking grow systems, grow houses, uh, 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 have been growing by leaps and bounds. Pardon the pun, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, there was a question here that I think you basically just uh, addressed with regard to how is. Uh, um, let's see, something with regard to the pandemic that you described, you, I think you've answered that already in response to what is their strategic management, Saudi Arabia's uh, you know, response to COVID-19. Uh, my friends, unlike what we're doing here in the United States, it's a very simple and logical and brilliant formula that has taken place in the kingdom with regard to people getting their inoculations as Dr. Turkey has just described. Everyone has a federal ID card. And it's simply, it doesn't matter if you are a street sweeper, a teacher, a business chairman, or the king. It's all done by age. It starts at the most elderly and goes right down through the list. And it's, it's been tremendously efficient. It would be something that maybe we, we might be able to take a lesson from here in this country. Um, just, major, just an interact here. There is a program called Tawakkan. You could not go inside a supermarket. You cannot go into almost anywhere unless you show in that application you are green. Green means you are not a virus carrier. The minute you are tested positive that you are a virus carrier and you go anywhere on a public place, you will be subject to a huge penalty. And people at the door, whether a hospital or any public place, just show me your mobile and it will show us, does it green right. or red? And it's those measure, you know, we live in a very dangerous, different timing. People have moved from the urban to the city. City are crowded with people. Diseases are spreading everywhere. This virus is not the first one, and it sure is not going to be the last one. We Very have true. to develop a management crisis capability, and we have to empower the society to act in coordination. Agreed. I, I, I wish we had a national app like that over here, but hopefully it's in development. There's a question here with respect to education. Uh, Professor Joyce and Dr. Turkey, I'll leave it to you as to who wants to jump in. How is education being retooled by, for and by Vision 2030 for Saudi nationals? We, uh, we are now more our, uh, job oriented. We, uh, we try to getting a certificate no matter from which universities in the world. It's not a license to get a job. I always, uh, when I talk to my uh, student at the University of Arizona, I said, don't come to me with your certificate. Tell me if I'm sitting in, in an office and try to hire you, why should I hire you? If you're just gonna present me with your certificate, that doesn't work. You have to learn, you have to be adapted, you have to improve yourself, and you have, same at the university, they have to provide the kind of education that's suited for uh, the jobs, not only for the certificate. I remember from a past experience, that is, I think the college, the college uh, center, uh, it belonged to the US Congress, about 15% uh, of college educated, they are uh, a taxi driver, 
5% of them are uh, janitors, 60% of them working on, on a job does not require a university. So keeping that in mind, we have to change with the new system. I'll stop here and maybe Paul want to add something to it. Paul, any final thoughts? Uh, not on that specific point. I think I, I would just like to say that one of the lessons which I think has come out of COVID is that some governments that thought they were very, very effective, very modern, have not done well. Um, and the governments that have done well are effective governments. They have the capabilities. They've also shown sound judgment and agility. Maybe the benchmarks for being a good government are increasing. Yes, very well said. I, that was, that, absolutely, and, and uh, I, I would just like to tag on 30 seconds here to Dr. Turkey. Dr. Turkey, I couldn't, be, couldn't agree with you more with respect to education. Uh, uh, there will and there has and always will be a place for higher education, but, but uh, I think the best way for me to sum that up would be in, in the 50 years, 45 years that I've been in the workforce, in job interviews, nobody, and I rarely say ever or nobody, but in this case, nobody has ever asked me, where exactly did you graduate from? The question has always been, what have you done and how are you gonna make me money? And it, you're, so you're absolutely right. It's about hard experience uh, and, and hard work uh, uh, make, make the individual. Uh, any, any final thoughts? We have about two minutes left. Uh, Dr. Turkey, anything that you'd like to leave us with before we close? Well, the way we want to look at the Saudi vision, I always look at it with what are the consequences of failure. The consequences of failure is tremendous, not only for Saudi Arabia, for the entire region. We have to keep in mind the Arab world are 70% are young people. They are over 500 million people. They have a problem with the basic human need requirement. If we don't do something about it, if we don't do something fast, we have to adapt, we have to change, we have to provide the basic uh, need. For me, when people talk about uh, high politics and high threat and in, you know, uh, international threat, I don't take that. For me, you have to provide food, Government should provide food, should provide sleeping, which is housing, should provide a job to have a decent uh, life. So these are the basic requirements of government to look at sustainability, triple bottom line, to provide what discussed by Roosevelt and King Abdulaziz 70 years ago, I think is still valid today. And that should be our priority. Inshallah, Dr. Turkey. Thank you. Dr. John Duke Anthony, back to you for a final thought in a closing. Uh, and uh, as I turn it back to Dr. JDA, I thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, it's been wonderful. Dr. John Duke. Uh, thank you, uh, Delano uh, Roosevelt. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what have, what have we just experienced? It's, it's hard to distill in a few final uh, comments and thoughts, uh, uh, the richness uh, of the exposure and the educational experience uh, that uh, we have just witnessed. Uh, but here are some takeaways. Um, the figure was 800,000 Saudi Arabians who have been educated in the West. Um, if one uh, takes the number of Americans who've been educated in Saudi Arabia and received a, a, a degree, bachelor's or beyond. And if one was charitable and rounded that number off to the nearest even number, that number would be zero. So just ponder the implications of the extraordinary imbalance in terms of knowledge and understanding and appreciation of another uh, countries and peoples uh, culture and civilization. Uh, this is one among many reasons uh, for the profound misunderstanding and misanalysis 
and misdiagnosis of the realities of a country like Saudi Arabia. Point two, uh, it was mentioned that two thirds of Saudi Arabia's population are under the age of 35. Uh, how many Americans or Europeans for that matter can uh, state uh, a, a similarly relevant uh, statistic regarding the youth the realities of their countries and their demands and their dreams and their aspirations and their preparations uh, for the uncertain future, transformative as well as continuing as Delano Roosevelt, uh, Turkey Al Rashid and Paul Joyce mentioned. Point three uh, is that uh, it was mentioned by Delano Roosevelt that Saudi Arabia is the number one country in the world with regard to petrochemical uh, plants uh, and uh, industries and uh, their subsidiary uh, sub sectors. Think of all of the reliance that all of humanity has on petrochemical products. And to state that Saudi Arabia is number one amongst the world's more than 200 countries in this is a matter of no, no small uh, moment. Uh, mentioned also by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Turkey Al Rashid uh, that 35% uh, of Saudi Arabians uh, women are employed in the public uh, and private uh, sectors, and particularly the former. former. That number is uh, equal to, if not greater, uh, than the number of American women uh, who are employed in the public or the uh, private sectors. This may seem like a typographical error, but uh, this particular hour that we've had together has been focused on, on facts, on forces, and on other phenomena that are related to everyone's quest for greater understanding for the world and the realities and the dynamics uh, with which we live and must uh, unavoidably contend and inevitably uh, can contend. If we do not, uh, they were on the receiving end of recipes for mistakes and being a superpower as the United States remains, uh, that translates into making potentially super uh, mistakes. Uh, and we're talking about strategic issues and we're talking about leadership. What is leadership? Leadership is not just representing faithfully and adequately and as effectively as, popular, as possible one's followers and their needs and their concerns and their interests and their goals and, and objectives. And leadership is uh, not merely at all uh, reactive alone. Uh, effective leadership is proactive uh, leadership. And proactive leadership is the essential for statesmanship. The world has many uh, leaders. Every country has many leaders, but few and far between are those that have statesmen and stateswomen, uh, I might underscore, and italicize and neonize and capitalize. With regard to the American component of Saudi Arabia's uh, investment situation, uh, it was mentioned by uh, Dr. Turkey Al Rashid that there have been 3,000 licenses alone in the past year uh, that have facilitated uh, foreign direct uh, investment. And Del Roosevelt pointed out that where else can one find within 24 hours a visa, a five-year visa at that uh, for uh, interested uh, corporations and investment institutions seeking uh, to enhance the material well-being of themselves and their investors than in a country such as Saudi Arabia. Uh, what is little known is that among all the foreign investment in Saudi Arabia, uh, American uh, investment in Saudi Arabia's economy is greater than the investment of all the other countries uh, in the world. In addition, uh, uh, the number one country uh, having joint commercial ventures with Saudi Arabian uh, partners is the United States. No other country comes close to be Great Britain, number two, Germany, uh, number three, and the others uh, fail, uh, uh, trail far, far behind. With Paul Joyce, we have an outsider 
who's looked at these phenomena. And no matter how much any of us practitioners of uh, politics and foreign policies and investment issues and challenges and needs and concerns, uh, we're blind if we do not also seek the input and comment and perspectives and estimates and assessments of outsiders who may and often do see us differently than we see ourselves. Outsiders are in no way capable of having the day-to-day -day knowledge and understanding and empathy and skills of analysis of someone such as uh, Turkey al Rashid on the Saudi Arabian side and Delano Roosevelt on the American side. Uh, uh, Paul Joyce is uh, proven, recognized, renowned international authority on dealing with, with uh, strategic issues. And his uh, books on management of the public and the private sectors and the strategic imperatives and the issues and challenges of actual and would-be leaders are central must reading. Now, this particular session will uh, be available for those who have not had the opportunity, the privilege, and the experience of listening uh, to these three renowned uh, specialists, uh, beyond specialists. They are experts. They're few experts. There are many specialists, but they're few experts. These are experts and specialists at one and the same time. So the podcast will be available uh, for those who haven't had this exposure. And for those who have, there's been so much here that even if one was an um, efficient note taker, uh, one could not begin to capture uh, the richness uh, and the profundity of not just the information, not just the insight, not just the knowledge, not just the understanding, but the tools that all three have given for more effective critical analysis and prognosis and predictability and a, and a capacity to anticipate uh, realities and that which uh, we cannot adequately foresee uh, in, in an uncertain uh, present as well as uh, future. Uh, we appreciate your attentiveness, your participation, your involvement in the superb questions and what Paul Joyce and Turkey Al Rashid and Delano Roosevelt have brought to this particular session. On behalf of everyone at the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations and all of our friends, all of our supporters, all of our um, underwriters and all of our well wishes, uh, our, our thanks beyond what words can express.